Today is the second day of the June 1984 seven day retreat. And since we didn't finish yesterday with the koan Nansen kills the cat, we will continue with it. I forgot yesterday to mention when we talked about listening to a talk that if anything strikes strikes you as being unclear, wrong or inaccurate, please bring it up in a meeting so we can look look at it anew. We talked yesterday about argument, the ingredients of argument. And as long as they're not clear to oneself being involved in argument, the argument will be driven compulsively, blindly. by superficial urges to, to win, to establish an existence as being in the know, the pleasure to dominate, to establish an image of oneself in the eyes of others as being clever, This goes on, but it is not conscious. There's no awareness of it most of the time, or only very skimpy awareness, particularly when the, the pleasure of the argument and all that is involved in it for oneself is all-powerful. And one doesn't want to look what is actually going on. There is in domestic argument, below the issues that are argued over, also the, the fundamental, I don't say inevitable, but it seems to be a fundamental polarity between maleness and femaleness, a strife, a division. Not that, it, that there is no difference between male and female, of course there is. But deep down, one may find, if one observes very carefully and deeply, that at times one argues as female versus male. And similar things are involved, the issue of power, revenge, subjugation, domination, and the battle between images. Which may not actually apply, but one has an image of a woman or a man, and with all that is associated with it way back into the past. To look at those things so that an argument can not just break up, but break up into air and light and into understanding. One doesn't take it at superficial face value, <coughs> which means the endless repetition of it, 
but begins to look why there is argument and dispute among individuals, among groups, the Western and the Eastern group. We've talked about this many times. Religious groups, national groups. And the argument so involving the ones who argue that life itself is is shut out, is not seen, is not the issue. The case presented here in the koan where in spite of argument about the cat, maybe the nature of a cat, there was inability to see a living cat about to be killed and to do the right thing. Not the right thing versus the wrong thing, but what needs to be done to save the cat. In argument, one cannot even save oneself. One tries to establish oneself as an image and save that image, defend it to the hilt. And the pain when there is hurt to the image. something that is so often mentioned in newspapers or news reports that right in the very presence of a, of a crime in the streets, people who are walking by, passers by or onlookers are incapable of doing anything appropriate. It's, at times it is impossible when there's shooting or knifing. I don't know what one can do. But so often it, it would have been possible if there had been freedom from what? What is, is one caught in? That there cannot be a free and appropriate action. We all argue about peace, dispute the ways of maybe bringing it about. But if one's own, one's own territory is invaded, will there be peace? Or is peace then just a concept, an ideal, non-existent when the territory is invaded, what, what arises in one. The need to defend, the need to expel, patriotism. All these ancient patterns that if not aired and attended to, seen, seen through, run us, no matter what our ideal convictions and arguments have been up till then. In this koan, it says that Nansen killed the cat. And then later here in a commentary, she 
Shibiyama talks about this killing. I remember also from previous Zen training, hearing and listening and reading, that there is something said when the precept of no killing is brought up, that the, there is a level of insight or enlightenment at which killing is no killing. Because there is, in truth, no division between the killer and what is killed. It was always a somewhat disturbing thought, which could not be understood. Or the dangerous scene of using this as a rationalization for killing. Or a refusal to really look at it. Here, uh, Shibayama says, Be no self. Be thoroughly no self. When you're really no self, is there a distinction between you and the world? This demand of being no self. Many people want to be no self, but one may realize that this demand, this desire to be no self, is the desire of self. In some respects, in some limited respects, one is sick and tired of the self, not in others, where it is pleasurable, fulfilling. Then one doesn't even question the self, but where it is painful, imprisoning, enslaving, then one wants to be rid of the self, which is the self wanting a better state for itself. So the measures one takes to become no self are seen in this way, selfish measures. It is trying to get out of this thought something that is projected, but not understanding what is the self, what is the pain and sorrow of this moment, the fear of it, and touching that instead of groping and grasping after ideals of no self. And one may have found out over a year or five or ten years or fifteen years that just telling oneself be no self is not useful. It's impossible to tell oneself be no self and then be no self. No self may come out of understanding, profoundly understanding what self actually is. And what its consequences inevitably are and its effect on everyone and everything. Not through adopting moral principles of living, but through seeing from moment to moment the activity of self. And in the seeing, being free of it. As if when one has picked up a beautiful leaf and realizes it's poison ivy, one drops it. There's no, there's no effort in this, no... It's just seeing the danger, seeing the pain, the hurt of it. One drops it. One doesn't continue to hold it. What is that seeing? that awareness, which is free of self, and yet self, as it has just 
happened, acted, is seen in retrospect. may not seem like retrospect because the awareness may be brief and then the self-activity and then awareness makes it seem as though it's simultaneous. But if there's complete awareness, awareness is no self. And that yet the action of self can be seen in it as it has just taken place an instant ago. Here, Shipayama continues, when you're really no self, is there a distinction between you and the world? If there is no self, there is just the world, everything. As it is, seen, seen as it is, with no antagonism or opposition or desire to dominate or win over, conquer. Because that is the consciousness of self. As it manifests in all human beings, not just in the majority or some people particularly, in all of us. We've inherited this brain, which stores memories of ourselves, of our past actions, experiences, pleasures, and fears, the pictures we have of ourselves, and then the feeling, this is me, having lived through time. And a feeling of security in this feeling of me, in the image of me, which is never secure. That's the, the paradoxical thing. One seeks security in an image of oneself, but it is constantly open to destruction, to hurt, inflation or deflation. And with it go all of our feelings of elation and depression. People like us think we're terrific, accept our ways, go do as we would like them to do, then we feel great. And the opposite is also true. If someone crosses us, is more powerful, has his way or her way, thinks all we are is this or that, limited, argumentative, selfish, then there comes depression. All linked up with this feeling and imagery of myself. Can one observe this from moment to moment so that it loses this powerful grip over our life, over our moods, over our energy? Shibayama goes on, is there a distinction between you and the cat, between you and Nansen? Is there a distinction between the cat killed and Nansen the killer? This is what is often said, I mentioned it earlier. When, when, the, when the precept on no killing is, is discussed, commented on, in, on one level, on, on the absolute level, there is no distinction between the killer and what is killed. I wonder why this is said. Because obviously there is a distinction. 
the cat is dead and Nansen is alive. It's so dangerous to play with this. I'm not saying that people who say this play with it. Maybe I do not have sufficient insight into this. This summer, in traveling, it, this came up twice, this a discussion with people over killing insects or caterpillars that <coughs> that eat vegetables. One woman came to talk to me. I'd just given a talk someplace and had said something about, or asked the question whether violence in oneself can, can stop. Before asking whether violence in the world can stop, needing to look and ask in, in utter seriousness whether violence can come to an end in oneself, which means violence in oneself has to be seen, acknowledged, opened up. And this woman mentioned how just in the morning before having heard the talk, having raised a small vegetable garden to get her own fresh vegetables, she's also not very well to do, there had been all these um, snails, and she just gathered them off and killed them at one stroke, she said, with, with her shovel. She felt bad about it, in a way. Particularly wondering whether this wasn't it, utopian to think it could be possible that violence would end could end in the world if here a violent act was committed again, killing snails. And of course she mentioned how everything in nature, everything in life feeds on other life, which is a fact. And then there was somewhat of a jump as it seemed. So how can human beings ever end war? It is, seems to be a natural thing, this killing, this violence. What does one do when one has planted a vegetable garden with great care, back, it's a back-breaking job. Things come up and it's a real joy seeing things grow and then one day slugs all over. Mm -hmm. Leaves gone or half-eaten and more slugs everywhere. I just walked through the park the other day, Highland Park, and. There were two or three bushes. First we didn't know whether this was a silvery kind of leaf or flower, but then it turned out to be totally covered with tent caterpillars. And one or two already had no more leaves. And another one was about to be defoliated. It seemed like thousands of little caterpillars on this thing. And no more tree. But coming back to the vegetable garden, what does one do in a case like this? First of all, is there a thoughtfulness about the slug, too? wasn't that woman, she felt very bad about it, and yet she needed or wanted her vegetables. There's so much that can be observed in how one deals with this. One person once told me that when she saw 
her little cabin invaded by flies finally grabbed something and killed these flies even though a precept had been taken not to kill and she said in observing myself I was really amazed to find there was a real vengeance in trying to get rid of these guys who had invaded my territory it was my place that I had built so there was a real discovery that there wasn't just the getting rid of flies for whatever reason but there was more to it and and this kind of discovery or insight can only happen if one doesn't rationalize anything the killer is the killed or so to say I'm one with this and <laughs> when <laughs> there's no one who's killing it wham wham <laughs> And I'm also the fly. One is not that dead fly. It's clear. <laughs> Thinking about a little bit further, one could say, no, I will not kill these slugs. These slugs are life just as I live my life. Let, let, let them have the vegetable garden. And then what does one do? One has to eat. I, I take it that one is going to survive. Not so obsessed by ideas that one will starve to death, which also may happen. People have done all kinds of things to themselves in the name of an idea. One goes out and buys vegetables, but how have they been grown? How did they get to be big? <laughs> green and whole, without holes. <laughs> Someone killed insects for us. Either by picking them off, by spraying. If one had these slugs on the vegetables and suddenly a flock of birds who are interested in those particular slugs descended and took them all off and would be very happy. Maybe, I don't know. One didn't have to take the responsibility for it oneself. These birds have done it for one. So to what extent does one make a problem out of this? And is there no difference between removing, crushing or spraying slugs and killing other human beings in warfare? For my, in the name of my religion or my country, my ideology, No one survives on that. One can survive on vegetables, but not on that. And that there's only death and sorrow and tears. And how will one not be identified with something, some, as we said, religion, ideology, nationality, how will one not be identified? Can one really drop it so that one will never need to defend or go to war or battle or argument over it? It's so easy to say, I'm for peace. It's so easy to say. But is man really free of attachment to? To names, images, being something, which gives one such 
sustenance, psychological sustenance. False sustenance, because we've, we've talked about it. It is always subject to attack and defense. and really not identified with being an American? Really not. Or a German, or this or that. So that also one's children will imbibe that, that freedom from that. Or will one think for the sake of the children who go to school and one will sort of pretend a little bit. People have told me, I'm free of my faith, but I want my children to, to know a little bit of the tradition. So they are baptized or sent to uh, catechism school or bar mitzvah, brought to Buddhist ceremony, so that they have touch with some tradition, so they don't, so they have something maybe to give them sustenance to lean on which is all the seed of strife and division, contentment, comparison, rivalry, or this false sense of security, which inhibits us from looking at being lonely, if we feel lonely, of standing alone, really standing alone, not isolated. If there is no attachment to this group, that group, this movement or that, then there's nothing between one and everyone. Nothing that divides. We say, well, shouldn't children learn something about a tradition? I don't know what children should learn. Lots of things to be learned. But is one tradition singled out as being the best because it was the one of the four fathers? At the present stage of history, it's not so much four mothers, it's four fathers. Is this learning or this information that one wants the children to have just as any other information? And there's li limitations to all the information that can be absorbed, albeit there's an, a, a large amount that can be absorbed. has to look at all of that as it comes up in very subtle ways daily living. If one just talks about it and listens to it, one may say, no, I'm not attached, but watch it. We can all watch it as we talk, as we relate, react to a news item. There's a final scene in this koan in which Nansen 
in the evening tells Joshu who may have been an old friend he's been with him for a long time I think he was the head monk there it doesn't really matter <coughs> came home from we don't know where and, and announced and tells him what happened during the day And Joshu takes off one sandal, puts it on his head, and walks out, walks away. One could ask, is he dealing with the situation that is presented to him? What is it, what is it to deal with a story like that? A happening. Or expanding, widening from this koan to our world situation that one hears about. How does one deal with it? One could interpret this that uh, Joshua is just walking away from the whole thing, no opinion. It's the easy way out, one could say. And it may have been this way, we don't know, we weren't there. It's also not so important what Joshua actually did. How do we deal with a complex, with a complex problem of arguing, killing, not just physically killing, but dominating each other, exerting power over each other, or craving power over others. And the paralysis of imagery of oneself which prevents clarity of seeing, which prevents clear seeing, because I have an image of what everything is like, what I'm like, therefore I can't see what I'm really like. As one sits, or walks, here in an environment of, of relative silence, quietness, no demands of daily living put upon one. And things come up, anger, terror, as several people have reported, terror coming up. What is, what is the right action? The right response, not right from a whole selection of more right and a little bit, bit less right to wrong, but right action, which is not opposite of any other action. Usually we understand something like right action to be, I must find the right thing to do 
which mean, means the doer, which is the self, which is all these problems that come up, wants to do something about the problems, which is about itself. It's trying to lift oneself up by one's own neck, which is impossible. Something new has to come into being. which has no part in all of that, and yet sees clearly. And is totally free of opposition. Conventional moral restraint precepts, which all involve when in thinking, thinking in opposites, thinking in terms of what one already knows, which is all narrow and limited and blinding most of the time. So what is attention and awareness in which there is no opposition to whatever is happening inside and out? One have, may have heard this question so many times that seems to fall sort of into a dead slot, or one may start asking this question, not assuming one knows, because one doesn't. What is a state in which there's no opposition? No one opposed, just what is, as it is, as it is happening this instant, before it's even, before anybody has yet recorded it or thought about it, it's already happening. And oneself is that. We're not separate from this total ongoing, ever-changing process of life. Can one be that? With all that's going on within and outside, not splintering off this as being undesirable, this as being too dangerous, this as being too terrifying. Just the whole thing, what is it? Who am I, meh, or just attending? With no opposition. which means no conflict, and therefore the energy may run freely, not caught in conflict with what is. Just listen.
We will end here for today.